Thanks, worship team. Natalie, wow, thank you, girl. <laughs> Honey, can you grab me that water bottle over there? Yeah, awesome. This is my son, Honey. What do you think? He's handsome, isn't he? Takes after his daddy. I love that boy. All right, guys, y'all ready for God's word? Are you really? Awesome. Let's get started. I tell you what, we have a lot to cover today, and uh, we want to just get right into it. We're starting a new sermon series entitled Overcome. Overcome. And we're going to talk about the overcoming nature of Christianity. And, uh, but before that, we're going to get it, I mean, we're going we're gonna to highlight the focal passage. And if you're new to foundation, how many of us are fairly new to foundation? Raise your hand high. How, okay, you're going to find out that I'm, I'm not your typical pastor. <laughs> Just kind of depends on how I feel and what the Holy Spirit is doing. What I mean by that, sometimes I may wear boots, sometimes I may wear tennis shoes. I may wear a coat, I may wear a jean jacket. I may decide to preach. I may decide to teach. Today we're going to teach. Yes. It might turn into preaching, but it, we're going to teach a little bit. And we're just going to get into God's word. We have about, a, about an hour and a half that we got to fit into 40 minutes. So we're going to get going. We're going to get going fast. We're going to cover a lot of scripture. Okay, guys? A lot of scripture. And, and is that okay with you? Is that okay? Can we just get into God's word? You know, nowadays, that's not popular in churches. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? God's word's not popular. Pastors would rather tell you about themselves. They'd rather tell you cute stories, all kind of anecdotal, little mumbo jumbo. But can we just get into God's word? Because it's God's word that sets the captive free, right? And before we get into God's word, I want to ask you a very important question. You're in church. I need you to tell the truth. Okay? I need you to tell the truth. You're in church. Uh, I'd like to know, and this is not bad, it just gives me an idea of, of, of where I'm at and, and quickly what kind of adjustment I need to make. How many of us are fairly new to Christianity and would say, Pastor, I, 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 I do need it slower. I, I need it a little slower because I'm, I'm new to Christianity. Come on. It's okay. All right. Anyone else? All right. Come on. The rest of you scholars, we're ready to go. No? Okay, then, then really, raise your hand if you need it a little slower. All right, I just want to know, okay, good, good, good. All right, you might say, what kind of question is that? It's an honest question. I want to know how deep I need to go because that's going to determine how I tailor this message. This isn't a cookie cutter message we just pull out of, of wherever and just bring it any away. I want to be a blessing to you. I want to be a blessing to you. So let's just get right into God's word and let's just start covering the passage where we find the focal verse. The focal verse is what? And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. That's Revelations chapter 12, verse 11. Now let's just get into chapter 12 because chapter 12 is probably one of the most significant chapters in the entire Bible. Did you know that? Chapter 12 of Revelations. If you want to grab the gospel message, at some point you will come to chapter 12 of Revelations, and depending on how you understand that will determine kind of what you get out of God's Word. Because chapter 12 kind of summarizes all of, of this redemptive creative history. Did you know that? Chapter 12. And you have John the Revelator who takes the revelation that Jesus Christ made known to him and he pins it. He writes it down. And some of it he probably understood. Some of it he didn't understand. But he was faithful in writing it down because it would be, it would be important to us. And we're going to cover his, his prophecy here, his teaching. We're, we'll, just, we'll just read through it and then we'll go through and just break it down. How about it? Come on, read with me, chapter 12, verse 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then, begin with child, she cried out in labor, in pain, to give birth. 
She cried out in labor, in pain, to give birth. All right, guys, verse four. Or excuse me, verse three. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. Now let's just break it down very quickly before we go to the next uh, portion of the passage and talk about a couple of things. There's three central characters. There's the woman, the child, and the dragon, right? The woman, the child, and the dragon. There is a lot of figurative language. You see the same figurative language. Guys, the same figurative language we find in, who is that? Okay. We, we see the same figurative language in Genesis when you have a certain young man that has a dream. How many of you remember that, that young man? Who was that young man? Joseph, he has a dream. Now Joseph is the youngest of how many brothers? No, 10 brothers. Joseph is the youngest of 10 brothers. Now you say, how in the world did Joseph come into it? Jacob is the promised son who God changes his name to Israel, right? He is the grandson of who? Abraham. Now the promise is that Abraham will be the father of many nations and specifically from Abraham, Jesus Christ, the Messiah will come. So he has this son, Jacob, this grandson. Jacob has 12 sons. Joseph is the 11th son. Now this is the, this is the issue. This is where we need to understand this. Jacob falls in love with a young lady by the name of Rachel. He, she goes to her dad He goes to her dad and says, I want to marry your daughter. What must I do to marry her? He says to him, son, very easy. All you have to do is work seven years. Seven years? Come on, how many of you would have not been marrying that girl? (laughs) You have to work seven years. Guys, I I set you up. That was like an alley-oop. All you have to do is, I don't work 21 years easily. I don't work a lifetime for this darling right here. You know, you just got to, you got to come on. Uh, and so he works seven years, shows up on the wedding night, Arlo, and it's the wrong girl. Come on. How many of you would have said, oh man, I got to read the fine print. <laughs> Cause the dad said, no, 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 no. See, this is the deal. If you want my youngest daughter, the oldest daughter has to be married first. So you get the oldest daughter first. That don't work when you got two sisters, right? Married in the same home. And so eventually he works another seven years for Rachel. They start competing when it comes to having children. Rachel cannot have any children until finally a promised son comes. His name is Joseph. Joseph is the one that is the consentido in Spanish means he's the, uh, he's the favorite. He's the favorite. That's what it means. He's the favorite. And so he is, he is dressed different. He's set aside and his brothers come to hate him, especially when he has crazy dreams like this. He said, I saw the moon. I saw the sun. That was you and mom and dad. I saw all the stars, all my brothers, and they bowed down and worshiped me. And dad got upset with him, but he took it into his memory and said, there might be something prophetic to it. And here it is again, this, this, the same figurative dream scenario where Joseph would be a type of who? He would be a type of Christ. He would be a deliverer. He would be a savior for his people. He would be the one that would, that would deliver them. And so as as the nations will what? Bow down. As those will bow down and worship Christ. They were worshiping Joseph. And you have the same figurative language here. And then you have, you have this, this, this red fiery dragon. We'll talk more about the dragon in a little bit. He has seven heads. It sounds like something straight out of the book of Daniel, doesn't he? And he's, and he's fighting for earthly dominion. This dragon is. He's fighting for not earthly dominion, but he wants the heavenly kingdom. That's what he wants. He wants the heavenly kingdom. Why do we know this? Because there's two types of crowns that the, in the Greek you have words for. And one of them is diadem, which literally means he has seven crowns seeking reign kingdomship authority. 
Now let's keep going with this. Keep going with this. His tail drew a third of the stars from heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it would be born. She bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. I want you to take special note of that verse. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she was, or she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Now that's an interesting number of days. How many, how many years is that? How many months is that? How many years is that? Some of you are, are, are doing the calculations. It's three and a half years. Do you know that later on in this passage, it uses the same number of days as another three and a half years? So you have three and a half years, then something happens, then you have another three and a half years. What are we talking about here? The seven years of tribulation. The seven years of tribulation, did you know that the Bible details this period more often than it does any other period in history? It details the seven years of tribulation. Do you think it's important? Do you think it's important that the Bible highlights it more than any other period in history? The seven years of tribulation, now let's keep going. Verse six, then the woman fled into the wilderness. Okay, we read that. Verse seven, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Now, let's just highlight real quick, who's fighting? Is it Jesus and Satan? How many of us know that's not a fight? That's not a fight. You, do, you put Jesus up against Satan, that's not a fight. With one word, he defeats him. Did you know people think, man, Armageddon's going to be a fight. Armageddon's not going to be a fight. You know what's going to happen? Jesus is going to split the sky open. He will appear in all of his majesty and royalty on a white horse. He will touch down on the Mount of Olives and Satan will be vanquished. He will be defeated just by him touching down. People think, oh, Satan's going to give him a fight. There will be no fight. None. The fight here is between an archangel and Satan. And you have, you have uh, let, let's just keep reading or I'll get into the teaching before the time. And they did not prevail, nor was their place found for them in all of heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, the Messiah, have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down, has been cast out. Isn't that awesome? Let's keep going. Verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Now you might say, what is going on here? You had a fight in heaven where the archangel and two thirds of the angel defeated Satan and a third of those that rebelled with him. They defeated him. They cast him out of heaven, no more to be found in heaven. He cannot just go and come before God's presence any longer. He's cast out. Now watch this. And now you turn your attention in verse 11 to they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives to the death. They're talking about humans here now. They overcame who? The same Satan, that devil, that, that serpent, that red dragon that was cast down from heaven. Now he's on earth and he's fighting us. And the only way to overcome him is by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. 
That's the only way to overcome him. Now, keep reading with me. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. His days are numbered and he's mad as hell. He's upset. Now, let's get into some teaching. Let's talk about the woman. The woman. Much has been said over the years in church history about who the woman is. And some say, well, the, the, the church is the woman. Some say, well, the woman is Mary. Some say that woman is Israel. Can I just say that in the Old Testament, Israel is many times referred to as a woman in travail. What does it mean, a woman in travail? A woman that is in labor pain, a woman that is, that is giving birth to something. You see this over and over and over. She gives birth to what? She gives birth to a man child. She gives birth to a savior, a Messiah, the Christ. You find this prophesied as far back as Genesis, where the Bible says that it's the seed of a woman that will ultimately what? Crush that serpent, that red dragon, Satan, the devil. I want you to read with me in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15. You have the prophecy right here. Read with me. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The Bible here and, and God is talking to who? He's talking to all of us, but he's talking to specifically to Satan, the devil. He's saying, you serpent, the, 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 the seed of a woman will be your undoing. It'll be that specifically, not just any seed, not just some random seed, but the promised seed, who? Jesus Christ. That will be born of a woman, will be built completely from God. It's referring also to the virgin birth. And here, you've got to take this. You go, well, you can get all of that out of one verse. You take that one verse and you see how many times it's referenced and referred to and the prophecy continues to unravel and you see clearly that it's the Messiah he's talking about and that Satan will be crushed by Jesus Christ. And you say, but you will bruise his heel. You will try to kill him, but he will overcome death. On the third day, he will rise from the dead and will render you powerless. For Jesus Christ is our Messiah. Now read with me. This is also found in the book of Galatians in the New Testament. Now to Abraham and to his seed where the promise is made. He does not say and to seeds. Right? He doesn't say to seeds as of many, as of many but as to one and to your seed who is Christ. Notice, it's not just a seed. It's not just seeds. It's not just some random seed. No, it is specific. And as a matter of fact, the Bible gets more and more specific to where it only could be one person. The Bible says he will come from the seed of a woman. He will come through the line of Abraham. He will come through the line of Jacob. He will come through the line of David. He will come through, come on now. And he gets more and more and more and more specific to it has to be only one and that's Christ. All right, I can see you're not impressed yet. <laughs> Let's keep going. Let's keep going. The same woman would be, would give birth to a child, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Not just any boy, not just any kid. No, this is the Messiah. All the governments will be upon his shoulders. He will be wonderful, mighty God, everlasting Father. Listen, 
75 times the Bible in the New Testament makes reference to Israel. Why am I making this such a point? The reason I'm making this such a point is because this has been taught wrong in the church for years and years. Now, if I had time to go through church history and to give you a little bit of a lesson on how this got to be wrong, um, I would have to go through the Catholic church. Because this replacement theology first was found there. It was continued through the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. And I truly believe it was this replacement the theology that led to the Holocaust. You go, whoa, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Replacement theology, without getting too technical, very simply is this, that the church replaces Israel. Simple, huh? There was once Israel. They forfeited their position when they turned from God. And now all the promises and all the, the privileged position that Israel one ha once had goes to the church. How many of us have ever heard that? You can't be Christian and not hear that. It's preached everywhere. Couldn't be further from the truth. Couldn't be further from the truth. There is a thing called dispensation. Dispensation is literally a time period or an era, a period of time where God deals a certain way with his creation. A certain way. There can be different dispensations. God might deal with one time different than he deals with another. Oh, but God is the same yesterday and for, today and forever. His attributes are the same. That doesn't mean that he has to deal the same way. Right? Any father knows this, right? Do you deal with every child you've ever had the exact same way? No, you deal with them differently, don't you know? And so this is what needs to be understood. We have different dispensations. We have the dispensation before grace or grace of the New Testament. And then you have the dispensation of what God is dealing with who? Israel. You have God dealing with Israel and you have God dealing with the church. They don't have to be the same thing. And the reason it's important not to get them confused, because if you truly want to understand prophecy, you must understand when he's referring to the church, and you must understand when he's referring to Israel. And if you get them confused, then you get prophecy all jumbled up, don't you? And you start thinking that he's talking to the church when he's really talking to Israel. And when he's talking to, the, to Israel, I mean, when he's talking to the church, you might think he's talking to Israel and vice versa. And so this is very, very important. And something else that we must understand here, if we truly believe in replacement theology, then you are calling God a liar. Because there are certain prophecies that are specific for Israel. And when you say, well, no, 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 God somehow puts them on the church, then there are some things that the church cannot and will never fulfill because they're so specific to Israel. Like the fact that the shekel would be used again in Israel. That can't be for the church. We don't have a monetary system, do we? The shekel is Israel's coinage. Like the fact that Hebrew would be spoken again in Israel. Does that refer to the church? Come on, stay with me. Stay with me. Listen, I'm not your typical feel-good preacher. I know that. And I know we're getting into God's word here. And for some, it's like, oh man, this is too much. I'm supposed to be feeling good right now. I'm supposed to be, you know, being told how I get wealthy and healthy and just to... Come on. Come on, we got to get into God's word. God's word is what strengthens us. Now, let's keep going because if you want to understand the difference between God's dispensation with the church and God's dispensation with, with Israel, then you have to go through Daniel. And this is important as I put Daniel's prophecy up here. Daniel is John's counterpart in the Old Testament. There were two men where God said they were the beloved of God. One in the Old Testament is Daniel. The one in the New Testament is who? John. Not John the Baptist. John the disciple who was what? He was sentenced to finish out his life in, 
in exile in the island of Patmos. And there on that island in exile, as he was finishing out his life, God gave him the single most profound revelation of redemptive history. But it goes hand in hand with the previous profound revelation he gave Daniel. See, there are two men in all of history that were given the lion's share of prophecy. And you say, but there are thousands of prophecies. But out of those thousands of prophecies, the two men that God selected to get the lion's share were the two he called his beloved, Daniel and John. And Daniel is what John is to the New Testament. Daniel is to the Old Testament. And if you want to understand the revelation in the New Testament, you have to understand Daniel because Daniel goes like this and John comes along and their prophecies completely coincide. You go, okay, okay, okay. You're telling me that Israel, the church, Daniel, John, exactly. You're with me. Come on. Watch this. The most significant prophecy in Daniel is found in Daniel chapter 9. The most significant prophecy. It was this prophecy that I believe, well, whoever the prince of Persia, some have said that was Satan himself. Some have said there was some other high-ranking demonic uh, fallen angel tried to keep Daniel from receiving the explanation to this prophecy and others. But God sent the archangel Michael to fight the message through so that Daniel would have it and share it with us. And here we go. Watch this. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most High. What is he talking about? Very, very quickly. He's saying all of redemptive history can be summed up in 70 weeks. You go, what? Wait, wait. They use weeks, the Hebrew nation does, like we use decades. We use a period of 10 years to signify a decade. They use a period of 70 or seven years to signify a week, like we use a decade, okay? Okay. So 70 uh, weeks, and then it's going to be done, and the Most High will reign forever. Okay, keep going with me. Watch this. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be what? Built again and the wall and even in troublesome times. Keep going. Verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. But not for himself and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. I don't want you to lose this. This is what's taking place. There will be seven and 62. Add that up. What do you get? Come on. This is high level calculus. 69. Okay, 69, there will be a decree that goes forth to rebuild the temple. You want to know what happened? That decree went forth when Nehemiah goes to the king. He was serving under Artaxerxes the king because Israel was being what? Chastened by God and they were under foreign rule when the, when the, When the southern kingdom fell to Babylon, the northern kingdom falls to the Assyrians. The southern kingdom falls sometime later to to Babylon. Babylon is conquered by who? The Medo-Persians. And now you have Artaxerxes, who is the king. He has a cupbearer who is his friend named Nehemiah. Nehemiah is Hebrew. And Nehemiah goes to Artaxerxes, the king, and he says, I am downcast, I am sad because my city, the city of Jerusalem, the city of my people lays in ruin. 
And Artaxerxes says, you know what? Go and rebuild it, but I'll give you one even better. I will sign a decree. And from that day, listen to this. That's what the prophecy says. From that day, there will be 69 weeks, 69 sets of seven years. And Messiah will be cut off. If you do the calculation, it's to the exact date that Jesus Christ was revealed as Messiah in Jerusalem. Not kind of maybe, sort of, it's close. I mean the exact date. Why? Because Artaxerxes, we have the date where he sent forth Nehemiah to rebuild, and it was rebuilt in a certain time period. That was seven sevens, and then there would be 62 more sevens, and Messiah would be cut off. That's the day that Jesus Christ, Samuel, enters Jerusalem and they say, all hail King Jesus, Hosanna to him in the highest. He is the Messiah, he is the King. And watch this, the religious leaders turn to Jesus and they say, Jesus, quiet down these men and these people that are claiming you to be the Christ. Quiet them down. See, because up until that point, Jesus had been telling people, see that no one knows. See that you tell no one, right? You read that all through the scriptures. He does a miracle and he says, go and tell no one. Remember the, the, the miracles I showed you about the leper that he's leading up to, to Easter? And he says, go and see that no one knows, Russell. Don't tell anyone. And people say, oh, that was just reverse psychology that he would get the message out there even faster. You tell someone not to do something, they're gonna do it all the more. You don't understand. He was preparing for the prophecy, the prophecy of the ages, because this is what would happen. On the day that it was prophesied, on the exact day, the people would cry out as he entered into the city of God, Zion, riding on a donkey, even as the prophet Isaiah had predicted it, and he would be claimed the king of the Jews. He would be claimed Messiah, and when they say to him, quiet these people down, he says, I cannot quiet them down. I tell you the truth, that if they remain quiet, the very Rocks will cry out. The mountains will begin to sing. The mountains will begin to declare that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, because it has been prophesied. It has been prophesied. And so just because we don't know it doesn't mean God doesn't know what he's talking about and what he's doing. Oh, now you should be impressed. Now you should be like, oh man, God, you kind of know what you're doing there. Did, let me tell you something else. Did you know that the book of Daniel is written in two languages? When he's prophesying to the Gentile world, he writes in Aramaic. When he's prophesying specifically to Israel, like this, this passage here is specifically to Israel, he prophesies in Hebrew. Two different people. He's writing to two audiences. Now watch this. <coughs> Messiah shall be cut off, verse uh, 27. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. You're talking about seven sevens, 62 sevens, that's 69. Then all of a sudden you bring it up with the 70th week and we're at the seven years of Tribulation. What happened between the time Jesus Christ was crucified, Messiah was cut off, right? He came into, the, into Jerusalem, that's called Holy Week, right? And by the end of the week, he was, he was dead. So Messiah is revealed and cut off in the same week, prophesied by Daniel, and then all of a sudden we bring it up with the 70th week, Whoa, this can't be all of history. It is. All of history right here. Messiah will be crowned at the end of the seven weeks. Whoa, but there seems to be something missing. It's called the gap. The gap represents what happens with Jesus' death and resurrection. The start of the church. The start of the church. This here is for Israel only. What happens during the church age? Israel turns their back on their 
Messiah. It was done purposefully so that the nations of the world, so that you and I would have an opportunity to receive Messiah, to be saved. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. But at some point, the gap will be over and God's attention will turn back towards do you know that God's attention has been turning to Israel more and more and more and more and more? You might be saying, but pastor, wait a minute. I thought the church re re replaced Israel. You're wrong. We don't believe in replacement theology because I'll share with you right now that there's a prophecy that Israel would establish the shekel as their, as their monetary system they have. Israel would be reborn as a nation, it has. Jerusalem would once again be their capital, Zion, it is. And they're talking about it right now, moving what? The embassy from Tel Aviv to where? Jerusalem. You wanna know something else? Hebrew, that was a dead language. It was already dead in the time of Jesus. Jesus spoke what? Aramaic, the New Testament is written in Greek. Hebrew has been reborn as the official language of Israel. Did you know that? The prophecy says that Israel would be reestablished and when the Jewish people would come back to their land, the land would begin to what? Bloom like a garden you've never seen. As I traveled through Israel, you see orchards and orchards and orchards and orchards. And the guide who was a former general in the Israeli army says to me, the Middle East would love to hate us, but we feed them. This has happened recently since they became a nation. Let me share something else with you to really knock your socks off. The prophet Isaiah says this, can a nation be born in a day? Yet, a woman will give birth to a child in one day and then the labor pains. That's the prophecy. You say, what? That's ridiculous. I've had, ch I've had children before. I've seen people have children. There's nine months of what? Maternity. Of, 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 of waiting, of, of the baby has to, but yet God says, this is what will happen when I reestablish my nation Israel. And in one day, the United Nations voted and moved to make Israel a nation after World War II. And it happened, and then the Middle East got angry and began to what? Have the birth pains. The birth pains happened after this is amazing. This is amazing. I want you to keep going with me on this. You have the red dragon as another character. This serpent, the devil, Satan. The serpent is found in the book of Genesis. He's seen as a liar. We, we, we have th four names that are given to the devil during this time frame. Four names. Red dragon, serpent, devil. Devil is a Greek word that literally means slanderer or accuser. Do you know that's who he is? He's the accuser of the brethren. The brethren, he comes and he accuses you. He says, you're not good enough. He says, you'll never make it. You're not good enough to make it to heaven. God can't love you unconditionally. You've blown it. You've done everything in your life. There's no way in the world you're gonna make it to heaven. And he always assaults what? The truth of God. And God says that he remembers your sin no longer. God says that if, you, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. And he keeps saying, no, you're the same old guy. And, and, and the Bible has said, you are new. The Bible says he remembers your sin no longer. The Bible says he has taken your sin, he plunged it in the deepest sea. He separated it like the east is from the west. It's forever ever apart from you, that the blood of Jesus Christ has washed you white as snow. Has washed you white as snow. Satan is a Hebrew word, which literally means your adversary. He is constantly opposing you and the truth of God. What I love is that the Bible says he is a liar from the beginning. From the moment he steps onto the scene, he's lying. That's all he can do is lie. Lie, lie, lie. He lies all the time. 
you see him in the book of John, God calls him the father of lies. Jesus Christ calls him the father of lies. Now I need you to understand something with me real quick. The book of John, how many of you remember the story we covered last week in John? I'm talking real fast because I got like two minutes. Last week we covered the story in the book of John where they brought the woman caught in adultery and they were gonna stone her, remember? And he says, where are your accusers? Where are your accusers? Have they all gone? Is there no one left to condemn you? Come on, that's significant. The accuser is vanquished. The accuser will be dealt with. He won't be there to accuse you. And then Jesus Christ will say, then neither do I, what? Condemn you, for you are saved. Now watch this. The hypocrites in that crowd, they begin to get angry at Christ. And they begin to say, you say you tell the truth. You say this, you say that. Well, guess what? Aren't you the son of Joseph? Read the whole passage, you'll get this. And then God, he starts talking about how he comes from the Father. And he keeps saying to them, I come from the Father and I've come to set people free and I've come to show you the truth and I am the Messiah. And they get angry and they say, what do you mean you're the Messiah? We, and you're putting us down, we have, we know who our parents are. We know who our dad is. We are not children of fornication. What are they saying to him? Aren't you a bastard? That's what they're saying. And Jesus says, no, let me tell you who my father is. My father is God in heaven, and your father is the father of lies. You come straight from Satan, and that... And they say to him, no, our father is Abraham. You're not even 50 years old. How can you claim to know Abraham? And that's what he says to them. He says this. He says, before Abraham was, I am. You go, oh, what, why did they make him so angry? He used the Old Testament name, which means before Abraham was Yahweh. I'm Yahweh. And they picked up stones to what? To kill him. Because Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Now, come on. Keep going with me. With the rod of iron, the Bible says, this child, verse six, go, with, go back with me. To verse six, she bore a male child. Verse five of Revelations 12. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. So we've talked about the woman, we've talked about the dragon, who is the child? Jesus Christ is the child. With a rod of iron is a reference, it's a reference to Isaiah. I mean, not Isaiah, to Psalms chapter two. Read with me in Psalms chapter two. At the very end of, uh, at verse nine, I, I left the whole passage up here so you can get the context. He's talking about Jesus Christ. Listen to this. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You see the same reference again in Revelations 19. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He's talking about Jesus Christ's second coming. Why is the, the return of Christ so important? Because that's when the 70th week ends. That's when the gap is done. That's when Jesus Christ comes, not as a broken man on a cross, but as a conquering king. He doesn't come as a servant the way he did the first time. He comes as a conquering king. He doesn't come as a child. He comes as the what? Resurrected God and king of glory. The Bible says that he will split the sky wide open. He will ride on a white horse. Tattooed on one thigh will be king of kings. On the other thigh will be what? Lord of lords. And with a rod of iron, he will establish his kingdom and his rule. And every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Okay. 
you guys might be going, man alive, pastor, you are not messing around today. I'm almost done. Third service is going to have to wait. If you go back to that passage, right after verse five, when he says the child will rule with a rod of iron, watch this. She will, be, she will give birth to a male child. He will rule all the nations with a rod of iron and her child will be caught up to God. Caught up could mean the ascension after he comes from heaven. He raises from the dead. But the word here is, is harpazo, which is the exact same word in the Greek, which is, which is used in Thessalonians by Paul when he talks about the rapture. And you know what I find interesting? Oh my goodness, I'm running out of time. Where did the time go? You have this gap in Daniel, you have this gap here where he's talking about this, this fight and this war and these things that are happening and you have Israel represented as the, as the woman. You have Jesus Christ. Then you have him being what? Raptured up. And, and, but right before the, the rapture and Jesus Christ's second coming, you have, listen to me, you have a gap. That gap is the church age. That gap is the church age. It's the very same gap that Jesus Christ represented in the book of Luke. In the book of Luke, when he was on earth and he was revealing himself to the entire world, this is what he said. He said, I have come to show you that I fulfill the prophecy in Isaiah 61. And this is what he did. He stood in the temple. He stood in the synagogue. And he grabbed from the attendant the book. And it was open to Isaiah 61. And he began to read from it. He went into the synagogue, verse 17. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And he began to read this. He began to say, the spirit of the Lord has come upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to recover sight of the blind, liberty to the, to the oppressed. And on and on, and then this is what he did. He closed the book, he gave it back to them, and he sat down. And he said, today, this prophecy was fulfilled in front of you. But if you read the prophecy in the book of Isaiah, he stops, not at a period. John, he stops at a comma. Why? Why does he stop at a comma? Because the very next line in Isaiah says this. The, vengeal, the vengeance of the day of the Lord. Another gap. You have a gap in the book of Daniel. You have a gap in Jesus' own words. You have a gap in Revelations 12. That gap is the church age because Jesus is saying, I have come, I have revealed to you, I'm setting captives free, I'm doing all these miracles. But the vengeance of the day of the Lord is not until I return. Until I return. And if you want to know how to defeat Satan the way God is going to defeat him, you must do it by the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. As the worship team comes up in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, this is where it all ends, right here. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, at that time, Michael shall stand up. There's that archangel again. And he's fighting with who? And he's bringing this whole thing to an end. And the great prince who stands, watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been seen and at that time, your people shall be delivered. Every one of them whose 
name is found in the book of life. You want to overcome death? You want to overcome Satan? You want to overcome in this world? You need to understand something. That God is waiting for the church age to finish. But once all the names that are supposed to be in that book are in that book, the church age will be done and the comma will no longer be the pause. There will no longer be a dash. There will no longer be a gap. His attention will turn back to Israel. And people say, oh, when the rapture happens, then I'll get on board. When the rapture happens, it won't be your time anymore. It'll be Israel's time again. Right now is your time. Right now is your time. Is your name in the Lamb's book of life? Is your name in the Lamb's book of life? With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask you not to leave this place unless you're sure. We're not talking about We're not talking about something simple. We're not talking about something that can be up for interpretation. We're talking about salvation. And if you want to be sure today is the day of salvation, I want you to raise your hand. Man, I see hands going up all over the place. I see hands going up all over the place. Don't let anything stop you with your hand raised high. Just raise it with confidence. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see all these hands. Let's pray together, would you? Let's pray this prayer with one voice out loud. Say, Lord Jesus, I put my faith in you. By your blood, I receive the forgiveness of my sin. Lord Christ, you are my king. Come into my life and seal me by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lead me all of my life. And with my words and my mouth, I confess you are my God and I will never be the same in Jesus name amen foundation I love you if you prayed that prayer you are saved come on let's stand up and get out of here